this section of the event is called The Role of Data in Navajo Economic Sovereignty. And so leading the discussion will be Alicia Murphy. She currently holds the title of being the Navajo Nation's first economist, uh, part of the Division of Economic Development. A little about, about her background, yes, yes. <laughs> And, <laughs> and Alicia currently has um, a doctorate um, of economic development focusing on tribal economic development. And so let me turn this over to Alicia. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Svarsky. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Alicia Murphy. I am working on my doctorate. So let me just correct that. I'm still working on my doctorate degree. I've completed the comprehensive exams, but I just have that low and last piece, which is the, the thesis or what they call the dissertation, but I call it a thesis. Anyway, but anyway, um, I'm originally from Crown Point, New Mexico, and my background, I have uh, been to school in New Mexico State University, loved Las Cruces, uh, go Aggies. <laughs> um, I got my bachelor's in social work there, Got my master's of social work at Washington University in St. Louis. I see April. Hi. <laughs> um, in St. Louis, I learned about, I went, took a class called Social Economic Development. And from a social work perspective, it was my first time learning about the use and the importance of data in talking about communities and talking about community Im improvements and developments. And I really gravitated towards that. And so when I got back from I graduated from there, I got back to New Mexico. I was still living in Las Cruces and I went for my master's in economics and tried to connect those dots between how are we going to approach economic development at the community level but using data. And so um, that took me on this journey I am on now, uh, completing my master's in economics and going for the doctorate in economic development. Being the only Native student in a lot of my programs through my academic journey, it was so frustrating that not a lot of my colleagues, my cohort, didn't understand the challenges that we face on reservation land, being, being of a unique identity and having unique characteristics and having that foundation we do have, but also operating in a world where we need to have internet connectivity. We need to have the wherewithal for what the stock markets, um, how they impact our, ourselves on Navajo reservations. So it was, it was a journey, it was a challenge. Um, I really asserted my interests in a lot of these programs in tribal economic development. A lot of my professors uh, tried to have these conversations, tried to enforce, or not enforce, <laughs> tried to uh, include tribal economic development within our discussions within our seminar, within our group projects, but it was just never really, um, never really full of, of, of everything that encompasses tribal economic development. Um, all this to say that it still didn't prepare me to work for the tribe. It did not prepare me to work within our government to try to focus on data as a foundational p tool we need when we're going toward economic development. So I love my job. I love that I've been selected to be economist for the Division of Economic Development. And every project, every idea that I have with my colleagues at the Division of Economic Development, just it's, it's so fun. It's so exciting because it's either something we haven't done before, something we haven't thought of before, but we're trying to do and approach these challenges that we are all aware of in ways where data can be helpful. Um, so. That's my background, um, <laughs> and for to, before we, I introduce my panelists, I do want to say that this year um, I'm working and have successfully contracted with a Navajo-owned business to, to conduct the new Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. How, how many of you know about that? It's called the SEDS. Raise your hand. The SEDS is an important document that gives an overview of Navajo economy or, or any region uh, an, an overview of what the economy looks like, the opportunities, the, ch the challenges, the, the breakdown of our demographics in terms of what the region um, 
can take advantage of in terms of making policy changes, policy movements um, in e economic development and a whole scope of things. Um, so the SEDS has been published for Navajo Nation a few times and the most recent one is in 2018 and I think I have a QR code here if you guys would like to take, a, have access to it. it it's been, it was published in 2018 and inside of this document we we learn about specific chapters, which is awesome, which is, which is new and hasn't really been published before. And the data that this document have relies heavily on is uh, the American Community Survey from the Census Bureau. So in my role, coming into the Division of Economic Development and working on a new publication, I wanna focus on primary data collection. And anybody who knows about data, primary data collection, where it doesn't ex exist before, is something that's very difficult to do. Um, so that's my passion. That's where I want to work on developing these data collection processes, protocols. Uh, I don't know if it's going to require legislation. But what we need is this data to be secure, accessible, and coming from our own professionals coming with from within our tribal government. Uh, everything that was mentioned today and yesterday during this conference relies on data, policies at the chapter level, uh, decisions in our healthcare and our education systems. Um, how do we advocate to bring capital into Navajo Nation if we don't have reliable data? So we've been working through through that strategy on how to create a primary data collection process. And I'm so glad and so happy to have uh, people who are like-minded in the sense that they understand the importance of data and how difficult it is to, to operate as a tribal government, as a business, as a community organization without uh, truly reflective data. So that's why I thought of this panel. Uh, these are folks that I've come to um, come to know over the past couple of years or come to know since I've been a part of the Division of Economic Development. And um, in my opinion, a lot of us depend on data and so we want to talk about how important that is in these specific roles and their expertise in their, in their respective roles as um, part of the community, part of our Division of Economic Development, tribal government, or um, legislative uh, um, part of the council. So. I'm going to go ahead down the line and uh, let them introduce themselves, and then we'll get started with the questions. Thank you. Yeah, it's a bene, or it might be afternoon. Oh, anyway, um, it's me again. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm Jessica Stego. I am the uh, a co-founder at Change Labs and uh, also one of the organizers of this event, um, and I. I am also a um, director of Native America Economic Initiatives at the Grand Canyon Trust. So I wear different hats um, across the different organizations that I, that I work for. Um, most of my work is in um, supporting entrepreneurs. So um, I, I look a lot at what, uh, what are the problems in our communities or what are the problems that were um, in our markets and how can um, native entrepreneurs fill those um, or provide a solution for those problems? Uh, and then what kind of resources do they need as entrepreneurs to, um, to be able to build a business and provide a solution? And in terms of data, um, that it just, it's something that's always been a thorn in my work because it's not there. <laughs> um, I, we had to learn with Change Labs specifically because when you're asking for resources to do the work that you're doing, which we had to raise the funds to create Change Labs and to build it as a nonprofit organization, we were going um, to look for those resources and we didn't have the data to back it up. So we really had to do a lot of work there. So I can talk a little bit more about that, but I wanna thank Alicia for uh, asking you to be on the panel. And um, uh, my clans are Thank you. 
Um, hi, good morning, Yate. It's all Kiaanis up until Daisha, so <laughs> we're all relatives up here. Um, Yate, she Douglas Capian, Yinchins, I skidney, Schlent, Toglini, Bashish, Chin, Kiaani, Dasha, Che, Nanish, Deja, Dasha, Nale. Um, Tist Uze, Dan, wait, Tist Uze, Dinasha. I can never get that correct. Um, Anyways, I, I'm from Crown Point, New Mexico, so I, I think, I don't know if there's anyone from Lake Valley here, but I'm the closest one to actually, Lake Valley. All right, so I have a neighbor. Um, I, I, I live as close to Chaco Canyon as, as I've um, come to survey everyone. So Alicia, I, and Mr., uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name back there, but we're, we're, we're all Chaco Canyon people. Um, have, uh, uh, Anasazi pottery shards all over our land, so it's it's interesting to see uh, that 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 historical remnant of e the economy going but way back then. Anyways, um, I'm the support services department manager for the division of economic development. I, I oversee the operations and functions of the division and uh, management of the budget and all of these other things um, that encompass operations. And I assist our director uh, Tony Skrilanis in the efforts to maintain and manage the division and uh, its operations. So um, with regard to data and, and its uses for our, our services, um, I, I'll go a little bit further on uh, when we have our discussions, but I'm always trying to be anti um, and part of that is understanding and, and getting that real world information to make real world decisions um, so that way we can move forward and utilize uh, authentic data and information to make right decisions and to advise our leadership in terms of getting to where we need to go. So um, I'm glad uh, uh, Delegate Slater is here today to present along with alongside us and join this conversation. So yeah. Good morning, everyone. My name is Carl Slater. I don't know if you're a kid, I'm a Santone, but she's chains and not any, does she say, do Santone, does she know? It's an accountant, Asha. So I'm Kiani born for the Jewish people. I'm a council delegate who represents five chapters in Chinle Agency Rock Point, the Kachuka, I'd say the wheat fields, Rough Rock, and Round Rock. And you heard I live in Round Rock. Thanks. Good morning, Yat A. She Brianna Viso Yenesha. Tobahin Schle, Kiaani Bashishin, Halsoi Dasha Chedot, Ayaskini Dashan. Ayaskini Dashanelle. This is the first time I ever just like blinked out on that last part of my clan. Ayambato <laughs> Dinasha. I am currently working with our Viso Construction as a project engineer. I just finished up my doctorates in construction management, and once I started my research process, I realized how important data was on Navajo Nation, because there was no data <laughs> for me to do my to do my studies, to do my research, and to this day, I still don't have enough significant data to really uh, work towards my my bigger goal, which was building a tool to help us in the pre-project planning of projects. So I'm really glad that Alicia invited me on this panel because data is very important for us in the construction industry. And I am also a new business owner to the Blossom Shop, which is a flower shop in Gallup, New Mexico. And I don't really know a whole lot about um, the trends or you know, what are, what are sales, you know, who, who really buys flowers, how much are they willing to spend. So like, I don't have any data and I don't think that there is a flower shop on Navajo Nation right now currently. So if I wanted to expand my business to Navajo Nation, like where, where would be the best place? Chinle, Winderock, you know, so th that data would be important in terms of owning a flower shop. So this is going to be a good discussion and thank you guys all for coming. Good morning, everyone. My name is Deisha Holion. My clans are Batani, Nanastasia, Nahabani, and Gliga. Let me stand because some of you are sitting in the back. Um, I oversee the Navajo Nation Corporation Code Office, which incorporates corporations, LLCs. Um, in addition to that, I'm also a board member of the Gallup Intertribal Indian Ceremonial Association. And an important aspect of that is that we utilize data um, in response to receiving any additional funds, whether that's from the state level, county, or the city. So in essence, um, that is what I will be, uh, our discussion will be about. Also, the transition of utilizing data 
Um, as of right now, at my current capacity as a program and project specialist, the system that we are utilizing gets very outdated and how that transition would be beneficial for the Navajo Nation as well. Thank you. So we're sharing one mic, but there's several mics up there, so try, try to use one. <laughs> um, so yeah, see, we have a whole bunch of uh, experts in several different fields and years, just a variety of years of experience working with, for, or next to Navajo Nation. Uh, we have academic backgrounds here, and having this conversation just would bring to light to, I hope, I hope it helps that um, levels the playing field in terms of how we're looking at data. And, and I know when I was in school trying to focus my area or my project on Navajo Nation, there wasn't much to go on because when you just Google Navajo Nation, um, it's, it's very, there's a wall there, a wall of just information um, that stops at only federal level. And we know that there's a undercount issue with not just tribal nations, but also rural nations when you think about using census information. Uh, and if you want to include the Bureau of L Labor Statistics, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, um, those are very helpful and we're going to build upon that to try to focus our data collection um, in primary data collection. How can Navajo Nation as a sovereign nation have its own data center, have its own data reporting uh, mechanism for all of the different divisions that provide this public service, public safety, um, and goods and services on Navajo Nation. So. Thank you all for being here and, and agreeing to be on this panel. Um, so my first question, you kind of alluded to it a little bit, but to go into detail on one very specific example, in your profession, what data point exactly helps you operate every day? And I'll just pick randomly, um, Slater. <laughs> you broke it. You broke your own rule there. <laughs> um, well, I, I would like to say not every day, um, but I will talk a little bit about data in the context of the council. So, you know, Alicia's position is unique. There isn't a lot of economic data information that is conveyed to any committee or the council as a whole. Is this loud enough or no? Okay, I'll try and yell. Um, I'm just kidding, I'm not gonna yell. Maybe if I stand up, those of you who can read lips will see me. Um, so, uh, some of you may have, who, was anyone in the SSBCI presentation? Okay, there's a couple, and some nods. So, something I brought up there, right, is that we had this small business and artisan relief grant program that was authorized under the CARES Act, and then it was continued into uh, the ARPA reauthorization of some of those programs. Now, something that I was hoping we would yield from that was data on small businesses or businesses on Navajo. You know, you can go and talk to business regulatory or talk to the folks who do the incorporation. They could give us some anecdotal or, you know, recent information on the types of businesses that are being registered, and that could give us an indication of where the Navajo economy is going. But at the same time, that might not be the perfect way to tailor policies that we would like to pursue from ARPA or from the central government with our general funds. Because if we need to provide assistance to certain types of businesses, those are the ones who may be seeking assistance under the program that I think Doug, uh, you oversaw it. Was that fair to say? Yeah. So, you know, that's one, I'd say, example right there. That's, say, a relief, but also in that process, trying to create incentives for companies to volunteer information to Navajo. And in that process, we're getting an understanding of how many businesses have, you know, standardized accounting practices, how many have sought relief from, say, the, um, the PPP loans, and we're able to qualify how many businesses, you know, have a need for capital. So as we're moving forward toward deploying this SSBCI program, we need to have that sort of picture. What are, say, the average need for a company with X amount of revenue? What's the, say, outliers that we may be able to contribute toward that are really strong businesses where they have a solid plan and we would be able to help capitalize them so that they can grow their business and be able to successfully pay back a loan or some other agreement that we'd have with them. So, you know, that's one thing, and I'm gonna stop there because I'll keep going if, 
if you don't let me, if you don't, if you don't shut me off, so. Thank you. Um, Brianne, uh, Dr. Visu, are you? So in terms of construction, data would be important for us, not just every day, but um, an example, I just started a project and at the meeting they mentioned it's taken 15 years for them to get this project shovel ready. So my question is why? Why did it take this long? Is it funding, bureaucracy, red tape? I mean, we hear red tape at every Navajo Native conference we go to, but what is the red tape? What, what, why is it taking so long? And you know, what processes are they using? Is there, so those are really important. And when I was doing my research, I was focusing on just the pre-project planning. So my focus was really from the start of an idea until we get into construction. And I had a goal of recording data for 40 different projects and understanding their processes of the funding land acquisition and how long it took and and really getting into once i got into construction understanding the cost the schedule you know what impacted schedule what impacted the um what what change orders did they have on the job and were and then it moves on into the operation and maintenance of the project and were the clients happy with their project and what did they not like? So there was, there's all these different phases of construction from the idea, the planning, and the actual construction of the project. And after, the, as a contractor, after we leave the site, you know, what did they like, what did they not like? And when we go into these projects as a contractor, you know, we just kind of, we meet with the architect, we work on our plans and we build the job per the plans and we follow up with our warranty time and then we're on to the next project. So it's really hard for us to kind of continue and maintain the data. But for me, it's really important in working with our tribes because I want to know in those 15 years, like what money did we use and how much money did we waste and how much money could we have saved if we had the correct data, if we had the correct processes, if we had, you know, people really just advocating and pushing and pushing for these projects. But, you know, I really want to know, like, why? Why is it taking so long and how can we do this? So this goes for every single project. So my goal, like I mentioned, was to get 40 different projects. And I was only able to successfully collect 22, diff 22 projects. And these are projects that have been built within the last 10 years. So it was really, it was really hard, not just because every project takes this long, so not a lot of many people had all the data, you know, even people who worked on the projects were working with a different company or they didn't remember what happened on the project. So, you know, they weren't really taking good notes <laughs> or, you know, they just forgot or, you know, really trying to track people down to interview and they didn't have enough time. And, you know, so those were, those are a lot of like, when I work in, when I think of construction, it's a small industry but there's just so much data that we could use to help these projects, not just as a contractor, but as planners and architects. And even down to the chapter levels, we have chapter officials really pushing to get these projects done for their communities and to you know, get a senior center built. 15 years ago, they wanted a senior center, so now we're barely gonna start this and we should be done in about two years. So 17 years for this community to get a senior center and you know, what, what is the data for why is it taking so long? And, um, and when I think about flowers, <laughs> switch it over, right over to flowers. When I think of uh, being as a retail business, um, like I said, if I want to expand on Navajo Nation, you know, where would be the best place for me to go? Am I gonna be successful in setting up my business in Windrock? Am I gonna have enough customers? Am I gonna have enough clientele? And you know, in terms of marketing strategies, what is the best way for people to learn about my business? And what's the best way for me to reach people? Is it gonna be through Instagram? Is it gonna be through Facebook? Um, you know, email blasts? You know, how can I reach like mailers in the mail? You know, what's the best way? And without having a flower business, I don't really know, but you know, I hear from 
people who actually live in Windrock saying, you should bring your business to Windrock. People are always asking for flyers. Like, well, that's one point, one data point, you know, word, word of mouth. People are saying that they want it and they need it. But it would be really nice to just kind of know the demographics and, um, you know, what what is a need. So that's that's how it's important every day for for us at, in construction and also in retail. Oh, thank you. Um, Douglas? Do I? Oh, I do. Oh, sorry. I stole one mic. <laughs> I have a tendency to do that. Hello, hello. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Um, I was thinking about, I saw this question and I, th I thought this is really interesting for, for us to think about how data affects us on a daily basis. Um, how many of you are artists? How many of you do something of a particular art? Can you raise your hands? Marco, are you the only one? <laughs> and the reason why, uh, the reason why <laughs> we have some stuff we're still with Marco. Um, the reason why I ask is because I recently really got into um, making jewelry and I, I, I made this one. I have stuff for sale. If you go to the Crown Point rug auction on April 7th, uh, every first Friday, every month, Crown Point has a rug auction. But if you have an artist, if you're knowledgeable of an artist, a lot of them, after some time, become really knowledgeable of how many, how much supplies they need to get, how much um, stones they need to purchase, how much wire they need to purchase, how much uh, uh, string they need to purchase, in order to make their 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 um, their projects to become more econo e economical. Um, so I use this as an example because uh, now thinking about it, I don't remember how many, I, I think I over-purchased some stones. So I have a whole bunch of these at home, but if I wanted to be more exact and more precise, what I would do is add up those, those, those key bits of information in terms of how many necklaces I want to sell, what that number is, and how many strands of beads I need to purchase when I go to the bead store to pick up be those beads. All of that's really incorporated within the data that we gather on a daily basis as individuals, as business owners, when you're trying to get and try to when you're trying to calculate everything you need for your inventory, try to calculate everything you need for your supplies to do whatever you need to do. All of those are key data points that we utilize on a daily basis and we calculate utilizing whatever system that we have in place, whether it's a calculator on our phones, whether it's a calculator um, that we have set up with spreadsheets within our computers. That sort of data is really important for us to collect. On the larger end, it helps us define key things that we need to identify in terms of weaknesses and strengths. Um, as, a, as a tribal employee, I think oftentimes we get the brunt of abuse. Um, we, we, we have people who are very critical of the things that we do, but at the same time, I, I want to be, I, not a devil's advocate, but I want to I I highlight some aspects of being a tribal employee. Um, how many of you received the uh, Navajo uh, uh, Economic Relief Grant, the one for businesses and artists, artisans? Raise of hands. Is that all? Okay, okay, I need to figure out what that's about too. Um, one of the issues, one of the issues that we've had with the grant, <laughs> I have checks in my, I have checks in my um, car. I can just give them out. Um, one of the issues that we found with the grant, and and sort of this was anecdotal, was the fact that um, one of the issues that we run into was the speed at which we're able to provide our checks to individuals. We only have three uh, grant technicians, and our grant technicians uh, really did a lot of the hard work in terms of getting a hold of our artists, getting a hold of our small businesses, and articulating all of that information into our systems and, and getting that information in where it needs to be, making the necessary corrections. So that's one key data point in which, in, in the reason why uh, our program probably was more delayed than it should have been. Another was just the sheer volume of applicants that we received. So uh, all of these things kind of factored in. As tribal employees, oftentimes you might, what's kind of coming into light is the fact that our personnel and, and um, Department of Personnel policies have been a challenge for all of the nation's offices throughout the Navajo Nation. So there's, there's hiccups and there's bottlenecks that occur. So how do we identify those key points in terms of making things smoother, making things faster, and making things more efficient and effective for 
all of us all around. So when I'm thinking about I issues and challenges that a lot of our businesses face, I don't just think of one issue being that it's Navajo Nation being a blockage. I think of what are the systematic issues in terms of how we need to gather data and gather gather information about those uh, those uh, bottlenecks and gather information as to how we can make things improved and how to make things smoother for our Navajo people. So that's sort of it, the really main important part of gathering data is the fact that we need that information from our businesses, we need that information from our communities, we need that information from our government. So that way we can put things together and make some 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 reasonable and educated uh, uh, solutions based. Um, laws, policies, and actions on our end. So it, 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 policy is dependent on it. So um, we're going to have Alicia's study coming up pretty soon. And that'll incorporate a lot of the information from our chapters, our business owners, and our community members outside of the Navajo Nation, as well as those within. So it's going to be truly comprehensive is, what I, is how I, I um, describe it the, the most, um, as opposed to what we've had previously, which is not a bad thing, but we learn from our mistakes, we learn from our challenges, we learn from our successes. All of those things encompassed together, we can move forward together. Yeah. Thank you, Douglas. Um, Jessica, would you like to add anything? Thank you. Um, I think one example I can give just really quickly is um, how many of you know somebody personally who sells burritos or f sells food? Okay, how many of you know somebody who's an a artist that sells their, their products, is an artist? How many of you know somebody who cuts hair in their community? And how many of you know somebody who, who fixes people's vehicles? Okay. So I think I've seen almost everybody raise their hand once. Is there anybody that didn't raise their hand at all who's just kind of not participating? <laughs> My <laughs> The reason I'm asking is because when we originally started talking about supporting entrepreneurs, some of the things that we heard from leaders, both Navajo and non-Navajo, were one, your people are not, your people are risk averse. They don't want to start businesses. They're worried about the risk. They also, we were also told, we don't have anybody on Navajo that's interested in business. Nobody's interested in that. They don't care about starting businesses. We also heard we don't have a market. Nobody's buying anything from, everybody wants to buy from town. And so those are the, the, the uh, perspectives that we heard about doing business on the nation from leaders, from people who were making decisions on our behalf from people who were, um, who were on council, president, past presidents, um, grant people who were, you know, had grants that they could provide, SBA officials, bank officials. These people that really w needed to be part of this ecosystem believed these things, because at some point somebody, it started with Janih and it became policy. And so the, we had to go out, you know, I, I worked for the SBA Small Business Development Center, and my job was, was um, to go out to Navajo and Hopi and find people who wanted to start businesses. So I was seeking people, and once, I, once people heard I was there, I was busy. So I knew that there were people out there that wanted to start businesses. I knew there were people who had skills they wanted to provide. I knew that there were people who needed capital. But only, I only knew it. And so as loud as I can be, it still didn't mean anybody was listening to me. So I had to go. So when we started Change Labs, and Heather was, was the one that forced us to do this, <laughs> Because we didn't want to do a study, you know. Whenever we somebody said that, we thought we're not we're not spending our little our what money we have on a study, you know. We already know this, but once we did that study, once we got the data that we needed, that's when people started to listen. That's when people said, "Oh, there are entrepreneurs out there. Oh, actually, there is a banking system on the reservation that that's there." It's just there, you know, in, 
on paper, the model is there, it needs to be used. It, it, you know, it needs, there's some tension that needs to be put toward it, but it's there. Um, and then, you know, you also find some other um, data points that aren't so positive, but, but the idea is that once you have that data, once you have that information, you can decide how, what's the best solution to address that data. So I just, that's one example I can talk about. So an essential data point that I utilize every single day is that I input data when I'm at work. However, within that capacity, I'm utilizing an old database that I can only input at my physical location within my office. So that's one hurdle that we face within the Navajo Nation Corporation Code Office, um, which is an important part and aspect of progressing the nation. In terms of utilize, u utilizing that, um, when, so currently right now we are looking to expand our office and when we have those conversations with the state senator of uh, the state of New Mexico, there's not much data that we are able to share and the justification as to why we need that additional assistance. Whereas for the Gallup Intertribal Ceremonial Association, when we receive funding, um, we do a data analysis where we collect surveys. Within that surveys, it gives a projection as to how much lodgers, oh, how much lodgers tax are coming into the city of Gallup. Within that an anticipation amount, it roughly ranges from one to two million dollars just within lodgers tax. And that's a justification as to why we, we receive funding from the state or from the county. So those are essential data points within the Division of Economic Development that I utilize along with being a part of a nonprofit organization. But um, capturing that is very essential to anyone's workplace and to also receive additional funding, which is something that the nation also needs as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So I've heard uh, topics, population, uh, retail market trends, um, community population with by chapter level, and then of course utilizing information on paper to justify the next move, to strategize the next move, whether it's from the Division of Economic Development, from council, from a community organization like Change Labs, and from our business regulatory office, and from our small business owners, and our construction industry. So having this data accessible to everyone here and everybody who needs it, and especially if it's in terms of policy changes, is incredibly, incredibly important. Um, before I go on to the next question, I do want to briefly, because everybody touched on this, and I want to talk about my approach to the Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy coming up this year. Um, again, going back to primary data, it's our, our attempt and our work to collect the data ourselves at the chapter house level. That's my dream, is what we can do in an easy fashion. It's secure, and it's going to be used for our community leaders and policymakers. So, I, however, but taking a step back, I want to know what data points are important to each of these industries or to our key industries. What data is important to our, our policymakers, our legislators? What data points are important to tribal government who, to ensure that our um, that what needs attention gets attention? It's not just anecdotal. And I'm glad um, Jessica brought this up because when I was in school, that was what I heard. You know, it's what you hear. It's the stories you hear from the burrito lady. It's the story you hear about um, somebody who tried to start a tire shop somewhere. It's the stories that are very important, but we need to back that up with data. And so how, in, in my attempt to do comprehensive economic development strategy with primary data collection, it's not me deciding what to measure. It's our communities deciding what to measure. It's our communities that 110 chapters are going to be different, but we need to know what is important for, measurement, for measurements. So at the, at the start of our, my strategizing to do the strategy, <laughs> I need to understand these points. So um, I'd like to just briefly shout out that we will have the Navajo Economic Summit 
and I'm planning a work session that I hope gets a lot of uh, participants so we can start this conversation in terms of what we're gonna, what we need to measure. And you know how you do the, the census? You, uh, you ask, answer all of those questions on that survey and you send it back? I wanna do that for Navajo Nation, but what is specific to Navajo? What is specific to Western agency that's not the same for Eastern agency? We need to, in my opinion, I need to break these down so that we can properly collect this data and provide it to all of our um, necessary industries, all of our professions, all of the people who do the work in changing the policy. So in my, in my eyes, I feel like that's um, going to make our comprehensive economic development strategy, the publication that you guys had of the QR code, a little bit stronger because it's reflective of what our communities are made, out, made of, but pop, even down to population. Um, my first month I was on the job, I wanted to know how population was reported on Navajo Nation. So I was given the runaround to five different offices on how population was counted for Navajo Nation, not from not from the not from the census, but from how, from Navajo Nation. How do we collect that information? And it's from election office. It's from the census uh, vital records office. It's from the Department of Community Development, and it's from the chapter levels. So we had about four or five different ways population was counted. And that's just too confusing for any of us to figure out in terms of how reflective it is for our true numbers. So these are the types of conversations I'm going to include and, and we're gonna be sharing more information on those work sessions shortly. Um, but this is all exciting news because I, I think everybody here can benefit their and, and, and target their services at a greater efficiency level if they had that um, information that's more reflective of Navajo Nation. But, so just know the summit's gonna be happening in June uh, and prepare for that, please. Thank you. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to add anything, but my, my next question kind of encompasses everything that we've been talking about in terms of the, the difficulty it cur that currently exists. But um, given, given we have full comprehensive data available to you right now, how would that make your services to our communities, our Navajo communities, that much more impactful? How would that change the way you operate and how would that um, give you the tool you need to get capital? Um, I'm talking about how will access to GDP, gross domestic product, gross regional product, to market trends, to industry trends, to um, just understanding who needs water and electricity. If you had that information with you now, how would that help you? Um, anybody want to volunteer? <laughs> We're fighting over mic. We're fighting over several mics. It's a very Navajo thing to do, I guess. Um, hi, uh, so with, with regard to having essential data and, and making decisions, um, I, I'm gonna speak in terms of an internal sort of scope within the, Nav within the Navajo Nation. Um, Having resources and deploying those resources as effectively as possible is essential for us as for myself as an administrator within the Navajo Nation government because we have dwindling resources so we need to be smarter with, with the things that we do. Um, we have a, a population of, of uh, individuals within our community that require those resources to be deployed as efficiently as possible. So we have a a, a, I don't want to say shrinking, we just have an issue with uh, personnel management um, in terms of recruitment and identifying um, our, our people who are uh, best equipped to come back and be employed as tribal workers. Um, I think all of us can attest here that we've all received the message of coming back home and working for our people. How can we deploy the talent that's out there and bring them back to us? How can we recruit those individuals that have gone to school and got that education that we were always told to get? So as a, as a, as a person who's responsible for the employment and personnel of our division, I wanna recruit the best and the brightest, but there's difficulty in us doing that. So if we had that resource, if we had the resources in terms of data, quality data in terms of making good decisions in terms of recruitment and getting out to those places where those students are and teaching them how to get into the process of the Navajo Nation and or uh, set up um, internships that Alicia and I are currently working on um, to set up those programs in which 
makes those students understand that there are available positions at home, that there are these jobs available for you at home. When we have those key items, we can recruit the best and the brightest, hopefully. Um, that's, that's the way the theory ought to be, but that's, I guess, a part of, the, of, of this whole component is that um, we're, we're trying to bring people back home, whether it be by business opportunities or by professional opportunities. So uh, it's going to be imperative that we continue this research and continue this knowledge base of, of information to flow even further. So um, who, I don't know who wants to have... So speaking in terms of construction, if we had data that we needed, we would just save so much money and save so much time. And I'm going to talk a little bit of, about well, the project I'm currently working on, 15 years of planning just to get shovel ready, two more years of construction. That's already 17 years just to, just to collect the data that we need of what were the projected costs versus actual costs. You know, where, where did we lose the most money? Where did we lose the most time? Those would be really helpful for our whole project team in understanding, you know, where do we need to allocate our resources in the, in the project, in the pre-project planning of this, just so we can get shovel ready. And once we move into construction, if I had the data to show the different delivery systems, design build versus CMAR versus design bid build, you know, I can show the data of it took us three months to do RFQs, one month to find an architect and get our design, you know, very fast, quick process versus we're going to take, um, we're going to go out and solicit bids. We're going to, you know, take another two years to design and we're going to take another two more years to get contractors to bid on this maybe once, maybe twice, maybe three times. We'll have the same contractors bidding the same price, and the prices are only increasing because every single year, cost of materials are going up. So, you know, we're spending money to go out and solicit bids. We're spending money to look at the bids, and then we're spending more money to solicit again, spending more money to look at them again. And how many times do we need to bid a project just to know this is how much it's going to cost. So if we had that data to show our leaders, to show you know, people who are not very experienced in construction but are running the projects, you know, to show them that the fastest and quickest way for us to get this project done would be you know, a design build project. We find the most qualified architect, the most qualified contractor. We have them work together and we give them um, or we ask for a guaranteed maximum price. And so I'm kind of speaking as a tribal member, like not like I'm a contractor, but that's what I would do. So as a contractor, of course, we want to have, you know, the most funds to build the best projects. But from the tribal point of view, they need to have a guaranteed maximum price, which means it's all, I'm only going to pay up to $2 million for this project and not a penny more. But when we do, like, des when we do design, bid, build, you know, we're only gonna we're only gonna work with how the construction documents are. If the architect missed something, it's an extra change order. If the architect forgot to put something in, or you know, some some issues happen. Issues happen on construction projects all the time, and all the changes they cost money. They cost money. It takes time. So if we had all that data that would show, you know, it took us ten years to get through this pro get through this process using um, no processes or using the old processes, it would really just help us in understanding how much money we're utilizing, how much time we're wasting. And we want to be able to provide these senior centers for our seniors right now. We don't want to provide them 17 years from now. We want to do it you know, as soon as we can. So having this data is really important for our, our planners, community members, our leaders, and as contractors, it's important for us to understand the contracting and um, just getting through the process of construction. And then once we move into the operation, you know, what are the best systems that are used? What is, does is Navajo Nation equipped to run really high tech, technology um, HVAC systems or 
you know, what's the best material? What's most convenient? Are we going to use material that comes from France, or are we going to use material that's local to us here? And what local material um, places are available? Where can we get our local materials? So all, having all of that data would really help us along with the project planning and the duration of construction. And I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier as, um, as a business owner owning a flower shop, understanding just like the demographics and the population of people on Navajo Nation, like where would be the best place for me to run my business? Uh, currently, right now, I'm in town. <laughs> I'm the business in town that people come to. But you know, what, what services in terms of floral does the Navajo Nation need? Right now, our biggest sale item is funerals. And our biggest client is Navajo. And they're going through funeral homes which are not Navajo owned and they're going through them to order flowers from us and you know we're trying to eliminate that middleman and so that they can come directly for us and as a as a business owner I'm trying to think how how can I provide services for my clients in the best way that convenience them you know do I move closer to them do I provide online um, a website you know what is the best way for them to understand the whole process of ordering funeral flowers or you know is there a lot of sweethearts out there that want to get their girlfriends roses and um, from my experience Navajo men don't buy roses so I don't even know if I if I <laughs> set up a flower shop and sell roses on Navajo Nation I don't know am I gonna lose money there or you know I don't I don't have that data but that's um, <laughs> a few a few examples. Now you guys made me lose my train of thought. <laughs> Thank you. So one thing that I can echo amongst everyone that everyone had shared here is that the importance of data is projection. How can we become better? How can we improve within our position, whether it's a board member position, whether it's a program and project specialist, um, allowing us to capture that data would give a justification as to why we, we would need to modify certain things. For my specific instance is that I'm the only employee for the Navajo Corporation Code Office. So those entities that are incorporating, I'm the only person that vets through those application processes. So having that data would be a justification to say, hey, this is the number in X amount of individuals that are submitting on a daily basis or a weekly basis. Therefore, this would then give us justification to create a position. Just prime examples like that is the significance of data and why it should be essential to the Navajo Nation which I want to thank Alicia for addressing because due to this lack of data, there's no justification for us or primarily for my office to receive additional funding from the federal government or from the state level. So that would be a prime example as to why that is necessary within the nation. And also um, within being, being a board member, that's just, a, it's a given if you're operating under the state of New Mexico and you're receiving any type of funding from them that they need that data so that way they can utilize it when they ask for um, grant funding from the US government. So th that's just one of my prime examples of the significance of data. Thanks. Um, you know, I think the data that uh, Alicia is trying to obtain is really more refining the focus of things that we already know. And so if I'm gonna be 100% honest with you and your question was if I had all the data that I wanted right now, how would that change my decision making? And there are a few things that might change and that's like maybe with SSBCI and how to allocate and design some of these programs. But in terms of say general um, economic development, general decision making on Navajo, probably wouldn't change much, right? Now, a good example is what are these work sessions and you know, update reports at the standing committees, those of you who pay attention to Navajo government, and I'm sorry you, that you do that, but it's obtaining data, right, from programs. So 
every four years, you have a new administration, maybe you have some new council members. Um, they go in and they ask for the same dang information. Or they come in quarterly or monthly, or they weren't paying attention like a week ago when so-and-so already gave them the information they had. There aren't a lot of big variables or things that are changing on Navajo. Yeah, there are some long-term trends. There might be some provisioning to services and resources within different offices. But generally, you know, if you have the data, which I think a lot of us, if you're paying attention to the government, if you're paying attention to the economy, you have it. And it's maybe an anecdotal form, but the fact that there's you know, five people here and probably most of us in the room, we'd agree on a lot of important data points. Um, how quickly it takes to process a business site lease. How quickly it takes to get incorporated. Now, you look at those points and you say, man, I am never going to get incorporated on Navajo. It just takes too damn long. Now, we could have a system where, you know, it's just like the state of Arizona. But why is our system different? Any ideas? Now, we've tried to create a preference system within our nation for contracts, which is slightly separate than business regulatory. But when you incorporate and when you're providing your documents, right, you have to make sure that you're just not a shell for someone else coming in if you're going to start to access certain types of benefits that are allowable under Navajo. And if you're registering with the state of Arizona, any cash flow arrangement that you have, waterfall agreement, you know, equity stake between you and someone else, that's between you and someone else. And unless you guys get in a fight and come back to the state to adjudicate those claims and mediate that problem, the state doesn't give, doesn't care. The state doesn't care. But here, we have values that we've placed into how we incorporate and then also the preferences that we add into this system. So it creates barriers, but that's a reflect or some obstacles, not completely blocking people off, but that's for a reason. And the data is so that we don't have non-Navajo companies sucking up all the contracts through Navajo or non-Navajo companies setting up exclusively on Navajo. We have our shopping center CP CEO over there. We have a lot of small business owners here, right? You know, the benefits of having a big corporation and coming into a small market it's easy to just take people out, right? Like Walmart. You know, what, there's a whole bunch of different services here, say trucking services, for example, right? That's a big one on Navajo where we have small entrepreneurs who are able to partner with someone like NECA, with school districts, with NDOT. Those are places where you could have larger logistics companies off of Navajo, and they'll probably come in with a cheaper price because they've built over decades. They have, you know, unified, uh, um, HR, back end for their business, you know, the cost of doing business is a lot lower for them than it is for you because your scale is probably a lot smaller. So, you know, when it comes to data, I think the anecdotal evidence that we have and the things that we all intuitively understand are there and they're valid and we shouldn't discount that. When it comes to refining and getting a more granular understanding of where our communities stand, that can help somewhat with the deployment of resources. So we look at the population growth on Navajo, right? Is there population growth? Who knows? Who, who? You're all looking at your phones. OK, I'm boring. No, it's basically static or declining. Everyone's leaving. Not everyone. I, I came back. Um, but economic opportunity is elsewhere right now. And if you want to put food on the table for your kids, you're going to seek a place where you can do that unless there's other factors that are compelling you to stay where you're at. So we say there's about 175,000 Navos. I mean, if you look at that CMID's um, SEDS report, SEDS report, you know, that's what they said back in 2018. We just had the 2020 census. It's basically the same thing, right? So as a business owner and you're located in Chinle or Rough Rock, your market is really not growing unless some other variable is there with contracting with the government. But as just the number of bodies that are here that might buy your services, that's not a particularly promising outlook, right? So what are the steps that we can take to increase our population? And that ties back into our water rights. So we were asking about data, right? The number of homes that we have and we've proven to build on Navajo 
is something that's considered in the adjudication of our water rights. Are we building homes? Well, if we're not building homes, then the court's going to say, well, you don't have a growing population, so why do you need X amount of water projected over 50 years? You know, set aside how insulting and disrespectful and just outright immoral that is. That's the way the court system works and the factors that influence how we adjudicate our water rights in this state. So what we need to do and what I think is important is here's a concrete example. In 2018, we passed a bill. I wasn't in the council then. Um, it was CAP 3518. So you had the CSN fund that was created and you guys know what that is, right? There's a big settlement on contract support costs and things related to that that REMA initiated with the federal government. The nation got about $554 million. It was deposited into a newly created fund that was set up to fund education, economic development, infrastructure, and something else that I'm forgetting. So there was a big bill back in 2018, $100 million. Who was listening to the last budget and finance report on my committee? How much of that has been spent or obligated? Just shoot some numbers out, or even people who weren't listening. Two? Is that what you said? No. So I think what I remember is 44 million. There's enough of us in the room, we can all make up different numbers. But let's say 44, 45 million dollars. So we're talking about pre project development and how we allocate resources. What has the rate of inflation been since 2018? Okay, not exactly 100%, but it has really increased, right, particularly and ex accelerated over the past two to three years. Um, a big part of that is spending out of the federal government. We as a nation are not going to know when all those bills go out and how things happen. Um, but you look at what the costs were then and what the estimate was for construction. And now we're entering 2022, and at least 60% of those projects, or 55% of those pro 55 of those projects aren't even obligated or under contract. It doesn't take an economist or someone with a PhD in construction management or business, what is it? Construction management to tell you it's going to cost more to construct that facility than it did back in 2018, right? So we know that intuitively. And we need to make decisions on how we allocate government resources and when we appropriate them that make more sense the great thing about that fund, though, is that that $100 million, say here's the big pie right here, this is the fund, we didn't take out a $100 million slice and put it over here where it's just sitting and you know, not making any money. It stays in there until expenditures are actually made, until drawdowns are actually made. So thank goodness, because there's still about $550 million in that account even though there's only about 124 or $130 million left unobligated. So there's a bill before the council right now. And I didn't vote on it yesterday because I was listening to all of you and participating in some other things. It, it, it's going to be at the spring session, so pay attention to this one. That's the third full week of April. It is extending the deadline for that money. It was built in that I think it had to be constructed within three, con, or obligated or constructed within three years. So I think in 2021, we extended that. And then they did another, I don't know, I guess it's two-year extension. And so now here we are in 2023 asking for, I think, a 72-month extension or something crazy. I'm against that. I'm against that because those costs are only a fraction of all the other projects that we have stuck in the project development pipeline. There's some of them are within DED, but there was money before that in 2016 that was allocated out of the permanent trust fund, the interest income for water projects and other items. I have a fully funded water project, the West Mesa project in Rock Point, and another smaller one in Rough Rock. Fully funded since I think 2016. Have they gone to construction? No, yes, exactly. Yeah, you guys got that one. That's seven years later. It's 2023. And they're saying with IHS, you know, maybe, I can't remember if this one's August or December. I keep telling my community, I get them confused, because Rough Rock and Rock Point should be about the same time this year. So 
That's numbers for you. That isn't exactly the local economic data, but is data about how we allocate resources and the time horizons for getting projects done, the cost of inflation over that time period. And so the tool that Dr. Arvizo spoke about would be incredibly useful, but at the end of the day, because so much of this is run through a political system, I bet you that bill is gonna pass in a few weeks. I'm not gonna vote for it. I'm not gonna vote for it because at the end of the day, we've only created incentive systems on Navajo, right, the LGA system. That's an incentive system. You get these authorities if you prove that you can set up a five management system. But what happens if you don't do it? You can't take on the authorities and you just kind of spin your wheels and goes on and on and on. What happens if you don't spend the money in the project? Well, you put your hand out and you bat your eyes to your delegate and say, please let us continue to work on this. It's someone else's fault and this. You've had seven years to bring on architecture and engineering contracts. When I started working for the speaker's office, that was the first thing that President Nez said he was going to do. That contract wasn't signed until like, you know, December 20th or 31st, you know, of this past year. Yeah, there is COVID, but the government was only shut down from April to August. After that, people were in their offices or they were doing remote work. So, you know, I'm not trying to be a pessimist here about data. The point is, is that there is a lot around us, and we need to open our eyes to it, and we need to use it. And so those inform my decision-making process and the things that I use to cast my votes on how to stand up our government. But this data that Alicia is talking about, I think is going to help us getting external funds to help make deeper impacts at the local level. But it can only be done if we solve or make progress on some of these things within Windorock, but also at the regional level. And that starts from getting a little bit more sensible. Thank you. Thank you all for participating in this panel today. It is so much information, but also we're, we're all on the same page on essentially on how important data is to, to be productive, to be efficient in our, in our, in our professions, um, all of us here at the table and all of our, our participants in our Navajo economy that includes small businesses, organizations, departments, our, our in, the entities that operate with us at the state and federal level. So um, thank you for joining us in this panel discussion. I want to thank each of my panelists and give them a round of applause for...